Hello, everybody. All right, so today we're going to start off our discussion with uh, some conservation laws. So, um, <clears throat> conservation of nuclear of laws of nuclear reactions. So, we've discussed many of these before, but we're going to take this opportunity to codify them a bit. So, uh, first rule. Or let's actually start with a title. So. Conservation laws of nuclear reactions. Right, give it a sort of formal sounding title there. So first we'll have the conservation of nucleons. So this states that the total A number uh, before and after a reaction, so that after a reaction, uh, must remain the same. So we uh, don't lose or gain uh, a number. Okay, so number two, we also have charge conservation might be familiar from other physics classes you've taken. So this states that the total Z number, so the total charge, uh, must also be the same before and after a reaction, any nuclear reaction. We also have the trusty old conservation of momentum. Um, so this state, this is actually two we're throwing in here. So this states that the total momentum and angular momentum um, uh, must remain the same. Before and after a reaction. Okay. And finally, conservation law number four, we have the trusty old conservation of energy. So this is we're going to take a sort of more relativistic view of this, which is that energy cannot be created or destroyed, uh, though it can be converted to and from mass. Right, so the total energy in the system, including the rest energy, the rest mass energy of the of a of a nuclide or of a material um, uh, cannot must remain the same, but um, you can convert between mass and uh, and energy in certain situations. Okay, so symbolically, with all that said and done, um, so for the conservation of energy, maybe we can go to another page here. So for the conservation of energy, um, let's say that we have some reaction A plus B goes to C plus oops, C plus D. And this is sometimes also written as uh, in a shorthand just to say A parentheses uh, B comma C and parentheses D. Uh, um, uh, we don't always use that terminology. That's if you just want to write something quick. But let's say we have this situation. A plus B goes to C plus D, that reaction. Uh, the conservation of energy says by Uh, that 
um, the following, that basically the kinetic and potential energies of all of these things must be equal. So this is um, uh, that, uh, well, it says that the total energy, let's start with that. So the total energy A in A plus the total energy of B has got to be equal to the total energy of C plus the total energy of uh, D and we can decompose those into kinetic and potential parts so we can say that kinetic energy of A plus the potential the rest energy of A plus the kinetic energy of B plus the potential of B equals uh, the kinetic oops kinetic can write a better K than that I know kinetic energy, not of A, of C plus the potential of C plus the kinetic of D plus the potential of D. Okay? Um, and so if we group all the potentials and kinetics together, uh, this implies that um, U, UA plus U B minus oops, minus U C minus U D is equal to kinetic of C plus kinetic of D minus kinetic of A minus the kinetic of B. Um, okay, um, and we know. Uh, the potentials can be um, uh, broken down into mass times c squared. So what we really have here is we have, if we take the right hand side on, over here, we have um, kc plus kd minus ka minus kb is equal to the um, mass of A plus the mass oops, of B minus parentheses the mass of C plus the mass of D and parentheses quote C squared. Right, so we're just rearranging our potentials uh, terms and their masses um, into uh, into this expression. So let me make this minus sign a little more prominent, I guess. There we go. Okay. All right. So. The right hand side of this is known as the Q value. Um, so uh, here, this is the Q value. Um, uh, I'll just. <laughs> Q value. And this has uh, obviously units of energy, but normally we measure it in MeV. Um, and it represents um, the heat of the reaction. So the reaction occurs, this is how much heat you uh, will get out. So, um, yeah, just uh, going on to the next slide, just to reiterate here, oops, we can say Q is equal to um, MA plus MB minus mc plus 
um, d times c squared. So the speed of light squared. Okay. And then we can say in the case where um, if q is greater than 0, uh, we have what's called an exothermic uh, mass reaction converts mass to energy. So we're releasing energy, um, releasing heat when our Q value is positive. Um, if our Q value is negative, so if Q is less than zero, we have an endothermic reaction. And we are converting energy to mass. It takes energy to drive the system. Um, uh, and if we want to be really pedantic about this, we actually also, in addition to the mass of the nuclide itself, we also have to include the electrons. So in the mass of the electrons um, from neutral atoms, so this is sort of just looking at the nuclide. So Q is uh, can also be defined. Oops. Um, Q is also can also be defined as ma plus the number of electrons, so za times the mass of an electron, m sub e, uh, since that doesn't change, plus um, you can see where this is going, m b plus uh, the number of electrons in B, ZB, times M, oops, times the mass of the electron, little me, minus um, parentheses MC plus ZC um, ME times ME plus MD plus ZD times the mass of the electron times C squared. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so that gives us this context for understanding whether a reaction is going to release energy or is not going to release energy based on uh, what comes before, or is going to require energy based on what comes before, um, what's on the left hand of the reaction and what's on the right hand of the reaction. Um, so, with that in mind, um, we can go ahead and talk about the mass, oops, the mass defect and binding energy. Okay, um, so the mass de defect is the difference uh, between the, in the masses before and after a reaction. Um, so this is primarily used in a uh, in photon producing reactions, so or gamma gamma ray producing reactions. So uh, uh, the let's just mass defect is the difference between the masses before and after a reaction primarily used in gamma ray producing reactions. Okay? Um, However, we can define this for any nucleus that we want. It doesn't have to be just those. Um, as we can count up the, we can calculate the mass of the constituent uh, nucleons as if they were free versus the mass of the nucleons if they were actually bound together in an atom. Okay, um, and so if we do this, um, we 
can go ahead and get the final or the following result. So we'll represent the mass defect um, as the uh, letter, the Greek letter uppercase delta. So delta is equal to the Z number, right? So how many protons you have times the mass of a single proton, so that's the total mass of the protons, um, uh, of what all the protons would be if they were free protons, plus the n number, or the number of neutrons, times the mass of the neutrons, um, or the mat times the mass of a free neutron, minus the um, uh, the actual mass of the atom, right? So the or the the actual mass of the nuclide, ma. Um, and the fact that those things are different yields a mass defect. It lets you know um, uh, uh, how how many uh, what what the difference is, or what the mass difference is. So. Um, and this is measured in atomic mass units, of course. Um, or if you wanted to include um, electrons in this calculation, because you feel the electrons are important, you could also define delta as being the number of protons times the mass of the protons plus the mass of the electrons, right? So the number, um, the number of electrons you have is in a neutral atom is equal to the number of protons. So you can uh, just take that out. Um, pl plus um, uh, the mass of, or the number of neutrons times the mass of a single neutron minus um, the mass, the atomic mass, the mass of the nucleus, m sub a, plus the extra um, mass of the z electron. So you can see um, these two, elec the electrons end up canceling each other out, um, so you can just use the top expression. Um, and uh, this is just such that uh, the atomic mass uh, that you'll see of a neutral atom is just this mass of the nucleus m sub a oops, plus z times um, uh, the mass of the electron. So it's that it is uh, it is in fact uh, this term over here. Um, so that's useful because this atomic mass is what you'd end up uh, finding in um, in most. Uh, it, that's what you see in your periodic table. That's what you normally measure the neutral atom masses. Okay. So just a couple of quick more points here. Um, in most cases, uh, the mass defect is greater than zero. So, uh, in most cases. Okay. Um, now, when delta is expressed in terms of units of energy, um, instead of mass, we call it the binding energy. Um, so first note that um, uh, C squared equals, as we've in the, from Einstein's equation, uh, C squared equals E, the, so the energy, divided by the mass. Um, and if we wanted to express C squared, in energy units, uh, or um, in our in our unit system, we would call this would be 931 mega electron volts per 
AMU, okay? Um, so now if we wanna look at the binding energy, oops, binding energy, which we abbreviate BE, is simply the mass defect times C squared. So, oops, BE, so this is E equals MC squared, uh, just where now we're using for the mass, the mass defect, the change in mass, um, times C squared. And so this is equal to 931 times the mass defect, okay? Um, so again, normally this is uh, greater than one. So normally, uh, normally, um, yeah, <laughs> uh, uh, you have some, you have a positive binding energy. So, okay. Um, this brings us around to a particular kind of plot where we can plot the atomic mass um, for a uh, uh, as a, or you can plot the binding energy as a function of, um, oops, uh, as a function of the A number. Um, so let's say we have that. Let's give ourselves some room here. Um, uh, oops, so let's say this is 20 oops <laughs> probably just kidding so this is 20 this is our a number um and this is our binding energy per nucleon so this over here is be divided by a Okay, or what we'll call binding G per neon. Maybe I'll make this, I'll bring this title up there. Um, so 20. Oops. <laughs> if we want to do 20, 40, 60, 80, so let's do 80, 100, 120, 140, 160, and um, 180, 200, 220, and then finally 240. We don't have really have many nuclides above 240. So what this curve looks like is down here at um, uh, we'll do this. We'll do this linearly from one to nine. So one, two. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So up here we have nine, eight, two, three, four, six, seven. Okay. Um, down here, slightly above one. So for hydrogen one, down here we have. Um, our binding energy is about one, um, uh, one MeV, or our binding energy per nucleon, um, one MeV per a per AMU, um, and then this quickly rises. So once we get to about twenty at twenty, we're at, up at about eight eight and a half, and then. Um, 
it starts to slow down and once we uh, it actually peaks with iron over at around 80. So um, here we'll call this peak iron. Um, and then once uh, iron, once it goes from iron over in the uraniums, it goes back down, down to around uh, eight or so again. And so this is a gentle slope down. Um, so you end up with this kind of uh, very sharp rise. So you gain a lot of binding energy per nucleon uh, down in the, the lower end of the periodic table and up at the higher end of the periodic table and the chart of the nuclides. Um, uh, you have, uh, you go down again. And so this iron is where you have the most binding energy per nucleon. So this is where, um, if you were to build thing, if you were to build nuclides up, this would be uh, the highest you could go without having to add in uh, a lot of extra energy. Now, if you wanted to break things apart, that's why you get energy. Um, you are getting your your. You, it takes more binding energy per nucleon. Uh, or you have more binding energy per nucleon um, and you you're getting you're turning some of those nucleons into energy uh, when you go uh, when you fission so over here you can think of this as a fusion side of the graph fusing atoms together to iron on this side you can think of this as the fission side where you're breaking out atoms apart down into iron and below um, very roughly speaking um, and so, um, through some algebra from before, you can show that um, uh, our Q value is, oops, nope, nope, equal to the binding energy of C, oops, plus the binding energy of D minus the binding energy of A um, plus the binding energy of B. Okay. So binding energy is a measure of the excess energy in the nucleus. Um, and this binding energy, this uh, binding energy per nucleon, the BE over A, um, is an average value. So I'll just write those things down so you don't forget them. Um, so binding energy is a in the nucleus and however BE divided by A um, so binding energy per nucleon um, so this is an average value over all the nu nucleons uh, in the uh, in the atom. Okay. Um, so this is different than what we'll call the separation energy. So the separation energy um, is. Uh, the energy required to remove the last neutron or the least bound neutron. So this is, um, or the least bound uh, uh, new nucleon.
And this is slightly different because this is really just turning your, your nucleus into um, from one to uh, from one nucleon or from one nuclide to another. And so this is um, you can give this energy as we'll call it E sub S. So E S is equal to the mass of a neutron plus the mass of the nuclide uh, with a number times minus one. Uh, so not the mass of that nuclide, but the, the one right below it, um, oops, minus uh, the mass of the nuclide that we have times c squared or 931. Okay, so that's, that's the energy that it takes to separate out the last neutron. All right. Okay. Um, so these are all different important energies that measure how you transition from one nuclide to a next to the next. Um, uh, now that we've said that, um, there's this important concept that is literally called magic numbers. Um, so the idea behind magic numbers is that um, it is observed um, I'm going to say by Glenn Seaborg et al. Uh, he has the element Seaborgium named after him, so smart person. Um, <laughs> Uh, so it's been observed that certain numbers of neutrons or protons in uh, nuclei yield especially stable nuclides. So certain numbers of neutrons or protons in a nucleus uh, are relatively much more stable than others. Um, and these numbers are 2, 6, 8, 14, 20, 28, 50, 82, and 126. So for whatever reason, if you have, um, uh, so um, for examples, zirconium has 50 neutrons, so it's relatively stable uh, with respect to neutrons. Um, also, for example, um, helium contains uh, both, so I'll say zirconium has 50, neutrons. Um, uh, can, he, can helium, uh, standard helium-4, contains both two neutrons and two protons. Um, so it is called doubly magic. Okay, and that means that nuclide is especially stable because it's stable both respect to neutron and, and proton. So, um, the, so effectively, these correspond to where the nuclear shells for neutrons or pro and protons, or both, are filled. Uh, okay, um, and it's theorized that there might be numbers of uh, above one hundred and twenty-six that are. Um, that are also magic, um, and this would potentially yield super heavy uh, but very stable nuclides. 
However, it's yet to really be observed in the laboratory. So people try to build uh, these nuclides um, that are really high, really heavy, and they they try to get them that are relatively stable. Um, but it hasn't exactly happened yet. Okay. But just know that there are these magic numbers, and if you have that many, you're uh, you're relatively stable. Um, your half lives are longer, etc. That's what that means. Okay. Um, all right. So now we're going to talk a bit about. Um, Maxwellian distributions. So some of you have hopefully seen these in other classes, maybe thermodynamics classes. Uh, but they are important to nuclear engineering. Um, and what a Maxwellian distribution is, is that for any collection of particles um, that exchange energy and momentum, uh, they will eventually settle into thermal equilibrium. That means, um, right, so they're not all moving around at the same energy and with the same momentum, but they'll have some distribution that um, any subset of them will uh, obey that distribution, have that same distribution. There's a peak and uh, um, and an average energy, and so importantly, uh, this applies to neutrons too. So there's nothing special about neutrons, but neutrons when they move around and they bounce into each other, um, they will also be in thermal equilibrium um, with each other and with their environment. Um, so uh, the, this distribution, the distribution of the number of particles per unit energy. Um, so this will have units of n, so neutrons per MeV, um, is known as the Maxwellian uh, distribution. Uh, n of E and is given as the following expression. Um, so it always has the following form. So the Maxwellian N of E is equal to, um, oops, come on, two pi uh, times the number of particles Oops. divided by um, parentheses pi kt, where k is the Boltzmann constant as t and t is the temperature. So pi kt to the three halves power um, times the square root of the energy uh, E um, uh, times the exponential of negative uh, the negative of the energy E over Boltzmann constant T. So e to the negative e k t um, with, um, we'll say, t is the temperature in Kelvin, of course, and k, little k, is Boltzmann's constant. Um, 
which is 8.617 electron volts per Kelvin. Okay? So if you're wondering what this looks like, um, we can draw a little picture for you, or a picture for you. Um, so, I want to say, well, oops. million distribution. Um, so if we have the N of E over here, and we have, um, we're plotting this as E over KT on the bottom here. Yeah. Uh, and we have one, uh, let's do one, oops, two, three, and then four. Um, what this will look like um, is uh, it has a sharp rise uh, and peaks before one, um, and then a gentle slope down, and it's basically gone by four. Okay, so um, this over here, the peak. Oops, let's get rid of this. This is what we'll call EP, which is the most probable energy. Um, and then the average energy is between one and two, roughly about halfway between. And so we'll call the average energy E bar, okay? So this is what this curve looks like. Um, so just writing those out. Um, the most probable energy in the Maxwellian distribution is, oops, oops. E sub P, and this is equal to one half KT, um, and the average energy The average energy is given as, oops, well, get, no. Yeah. So this is E bar, um, and this is equal to one over N time, uh, integrating from zero to infinity Right, so we're just taking the integral definition of the average um, from zero to infinity of uh, n of e times e de. Okay, and I won't make you do this right now, but uh, if you work through this, it turns out that this integrates to three halves kT, okay? Um, and the other important thing to note about this is that, um, uh, oops, uh, which is an important value to know for nuclear engineers, is that kT at 
room temperature um, is 0 0.0253 eV. So it's not a whole lot of energy, but uh, that's what uh, that's that's what it is. Okay. All right. Well, thanks everybody, and uh, you will see me again next time.